Good day, Trish. First of all, thanks for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. For our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us where you live and work and what you do, and then perhaps go back to the beginning, give us some of your background, where you grew up, where, where you did your schooling, and in what, and then kind of segue into how you entered into the whole L&D world. Wow, well, that's a pretty big question, guys. So, hello. Good to see you. Thank you so much for having me on the recording. I've been watching your legacy recordings now in HPT for a bazillion years, <laughs> and I, I appreciate being part of the collection and having this conversation today. So uh, my name is Trish Ewell. Uh, a lot of people know me as the founder of Owl's Ledge. There's actually a story behind the name of the company, which I'll share in a moment because a lot of people don't know it. Um, and what do I do? I, you know, it's an interesting question, right? Because we often answer that question with whatever current role or whatever current job we have. And I'd like to answer it a little bit differently. Um, so what I do is I actually equip and empower those who equip and empower others. And the reason why that's important is that as we get into sort of Trish Yule's origin story here, that's a common thread and a common theme um, and I was able to craft that, um, actually, here's a pretty cool resource, uh, in two ways. I was able to come up with that sentence. Um, number one, the idea came from Dan Pink. Uh, as a matter of fact, it came from, uh, Dan's got a video that's actually available on YouTube. You can find it. It's What's Your Sentence with Dan Pink. And it was an activity that he actually did as part of the keynote at the ASTD conference back in 2010 here in Chicago. Uh, and it's all about like at the end of days, at the end of our days, like what do you want to be known for? What's kind of, uh, in my case, I think about it as my superpower, right? And also my mission on earth. And then the way that I came up with the words and how to actually say it took a, took a bit of time. So for those of you who maybe decide to try this, this wasn't something where I went, oh, got it. I've got my sentence. Here it is. Um, but the words actually were a gift from another friend and colleague named Terrence Donahue, who is actually the head of global learning for Emerson Electric. So um, thank you, Terrence, who's always so good with, uh, with words and one of the people in my life that helps me take really long conversations like this one and actually condense it down into something much more simple. Um, so... Uh, Again, how did I get into L&D? There is uh, an interesting story there, or at least, of course, I think it's interesting because my background originally started, my professional work actually started as an equestrian. So I started actually in the world of show horses um, and at one point, very, very early in my life, had an eye towards the Olympics. And what's uh, cool about that is even though I have never personally gotten anywhere near the levels necessary to compete in the Olympics, I have friends who have and have had the honor and the privilege of being at a lot of uh, events for the United States equestrian team. So uh, including being at the Olympic show trials. And the reason why that's important is for a number of reasons. That was the original focus of my undergrad work. And people ask me all the time, well, wait a minute, your studies were in undergrad were equestrian studies and communications. And they were like, what were you going to do with that? And I was going to do two things, much to my father's chagrin. Uh, one was, so this was in the late 1980s. And um, what I wanted to do with the horses and with the communications piece was to actually become a journalist and travel the world and cover equestrian events. And at that time, we didn't have that kind of coverage. We didn't have a horse channel on, you know, 200 billion different channels on our Xfinity TV or on our Direct TV. That opportunity did not exist, but I had, I had it in my head that that's what I wanted to do. And the second thing that I wanted to do with the equestrian studies degree was uh, my favorite breed of horses are Arabian horses, and they're a little bit small of a breed for my stature. And so I had this grand ambition that somehow with all the science and stuff that was involved, that I was going to have these Arabian horse breeding farms and was going to somehow figure out how to enlarge the breed. So... The thing about that is I, I grew up as actually a paid athlete. I was what's called a catch rider, which means that people that have show horses for whatever reason, uh, that those animals are not being fully utilized, 
can't just stay in the stable in their stalls. What happens is, if that happens, is that the animal loses value. And you're talking about some of these animals, and many people don't know, are um, can be tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in valuation. And if those animals don't compete, then they don't keep their standings within the different professional environments um, or associations that pertain to the different disciplines that are involved in uh, equestrian sports, right? So some people think, as an example, about Western, Western riding, we think about cowboys. Some people think about people jumping over fences. That's usually more on the English side. There's also the discipline of side saddle. There's dressage. There's cross country. There's a number of different disciplines within that sport. And uh, for me, in college, it was three-phase eventing. And three-phase eventing is three different disciplines, which actually repeats later in my, later in my life. It was three, it's three disciplines. It's dressage, it's cross-country, jumping, and then it's also stadium jumping. So you're jumping a horse in a ring. And so I learned at a very early age, and this ties into HPT for me, I learned how to, number one, I learned the value of the resource that I had access to, right? So I was competing and riding other people's horses. And in order for me to keep riding other people's horses and having horses to compete, those animals that I was working with had to perform and they had to perform well. So if you want to talk about being able to get performance out of another creature, try trying to get performance out of, you know, an alien creature that's non-human, right? So... So competing the horses, which have a mind of their own, and of course also have um, weight to their advantage, you can't um, you can't negative behavior reinforcement loop them into it, right? These are animals that are actually very very sensitive. Um, You can't uh, you can't make them comply. So when you're facing one of these huge animals that again has a mind of its own, has its own. Uh, is having its own uh, intense reaction to the environment around it and the environment around it is responding to, you know, the horse as well and you're riding into a four and a half foot fence, you, you better have, you better have some things together, um, including your mind and your body and your breath and your skill at that point to be able to encourage that animal to jump over the fence rather than go in it or throw you through it, which um, you often learn in that case by doing. (laughs) So what was cool with that in looking back on it in hindsight was the early years competing as an athlete um, and, and earning a living as an athlete was that again, it, that linkage to outcomes, right? Like I always, I, and being able to leverage working with something or somebody else in order to achieve that has always been part of my frame since I was seven years old. Uh, And that played into later on in my life when I actually wound up in corporate America, which I never thought I would be in. I never thought, I always thought that I would, again, I had these Olympic dreams and I thought that I would wind up at a stable somewhere and, and, you know, do the journalist um, thing. And so when I wound up in corporate America, the first place that I wound up in was actually in a screw machine shop in a shop outside of Cleveland that was actually making screws for tanks for Desert Storm. And uh, what had happened was I had had a car accident that had ended my athletic career for a period of time. And so I had to shift gears. And so instead of being able to compete in sport and be able to make a living, I now had to use this um, crazy hobby that I had, which at the time was kind of a hobby, and that was being able to work with computers. And so I was at this screw machine shop, this manufacturing environment, very, very small shop. And I worked in the office and the woman there who actually did payroll, did payroll by having graph paper taped together and she did it by hand. So trying to figure out like all the taxes and trying to figure out like, you know, just who was going to get paid what. She did all of the math um, by hand with this, you know, very neat, you know, pencil writing. And the office got a brand new computer, and that computer was running DOS 3 and Windows, actually it might have been running DOS 6, and it was running Windows 3.1, I 
I don't even think it was 3.11 yet. And it was this whole brand new thing. And they were freaked out and scared of it, so nobody used it. So it just sat on this desk. And I wound up taking this payroll system that was on taped together graph paper and converting it over to Lotus 123. And it was uh, Lotus 123 version one. So it was before WYSIWYG. It was before what you see is what you get, which means that in order to understand what the spreadsheet looked like that I was creating, you had to print it off on a dot matrix printer. And that would take um, forever, but you could print it and see your columns and your rows and these nice tables and then make whatever adjustments um, on the screen that you needed to. So that was my first foray into technology as uh, earning a living. I also used to, this you might laugh at, I would get phone calls. I started being kind of like at-home tech support. And I would get phone calls and I would charge people like 50 bucks to tell them how to get out of that black screen with the blinking cursor and get back to where the pictures are, which was, of course, people would accidentally exit out a program manager and they'd wind up at the DOS prompt and they wouldn't know how to get back into Windows again. And I would teach them how to type in win, W-I-N, at the C prompt and be able to get back into program manager. And I got paid very (laughs) handsomely for being able to do that. So... That was kind of where things um, started. Is this the kind of stuff that you want to hear about? Yes, Is this, uh... yes. So after that, yep. where did that go? Uh, so then I... Um, uh, so the computer thing was one of those things where we were the nerdy kids in high school that all had computers. So we had Apple IIEs, and I had friends that worked. Their parents worked for Tandy. My father's a nuclear engineer. We always had computers at home. He had systems and mainframes and so on and so forth at the office. And so we always had geeky toys at home. Uh, We had Texas Instruments. We had Commodores. We had, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And actually, it's kind of funny. I was just thinking about um, voice synthesizers on on Commodore 64s the other day and just being delighted in middle school, me and my best friend typing in words on the Commodore 64 just to hear the computer in its computer voice come back and actually try to uh, perform human language. And I was thinking about that um, as I was speaking to Alexa, my Amazon Echo, um, mm-hmm. and I was like, wow, how far how far we've come from that, you know, from what was happening in the early 80s with that kind of technology and to where it is that we are, of course, today. So... Back at the uh, back of the ranch outside of Cleveland, um, I made a uh, move actually from Cleveland to Chicago uh, in the early 90s. And when I first came to Chicago, I wound up at one of the largest law firms in the United States. And the significance of that is a, a couple of things. Um, one is, It was at a time before we got into what's now called e-discovery or electronic discovery. This was at a time with law firms when the discovery process, so when the plaintiff sues the defendant and the defendant has to like hand over stuff, that stuff used to show up in big boxes, right? It was reams and reams and reams of paper. And of course, today, what winds up is happening as part of the discovery process is it's all technology. It's all electronic files that come from a variety of different data sources. So we, so I was right there starting in um, law firms, in big law firms at a time when we were right at that inflection point between moving from analog and into the digital world. Um, that also means that I was at law firms One of the first jobs that I had, uh, because I worked in the IT department, and one of the first jobs that I had was that um, we were literally walking around to the legal secretary's desks and taking their their typewriters and taking their typewriters away and then giving them these crazy computers, which, of course, you know, back in the early 90s, no one had that at home. You know, we didn't have email. We didn't get email in the office until like, what, 1995. We didn't have web browsing until 1993. So there wasn't, you know, all of the uses that we do with that kind of technology today, for those of you who didn't live through it or experience it. um, You youngsters, yeah. You youngsters, yeah. Like, it wasn't as ubiquitous, of course, as it is today. And so... Uh, you know, so it was, we were an IT department of about 20 people, and I actually was a subcontractor. I had um, gone there 
in order to help them with a transformation project that they had. They were actually um, starting to, you know, so again, they were they were shifting this technology over to automation. This was automation of the 1990s was computer automation. Uh, and I had just before the law firm contract, I had done a contract actually with um, Don Tech. Now, Don Tech was uh, the Yellow Pages. So when I first moved to Chicago, I did a short stint at Don Tech. And, and Don Tech was a partnership. It was a company that was actually created from Ameritech, which eventually got bought by AT&T, so the phone company, and Donnelly, which is um, a printing, it's a printing company. And so our, our Donnelly and Sons, as a matter of fact, um, many people don't know this, but as a printer, they're actually the printers that printed the Harry Potter books. Um, so way back before Harry Potter, back in the 1990s, this Don Tech, so Ameritech and Donnelly together created the Yellow Pages. And I spent some time with them also under a contract and the same kind of thing. We were taking away typewriters and, um, like brother word processors, in some cases, the machine, not the people. And we were replacing on people's desks, these computers that no one had any idea how to use. Um, so that was kind of how I fell into software training was suddenly there was this piece of hardware. A lot of people were afraid of it. They had no idea how these machines worked. They were afraid of what the machines meant. And of course, as people in the workspace, we want to do a good job, right? So we can go back to McGregor X and Y and talk about, you know, theory. Do people need a stick or do they need a carrot? And I would say that most people want to come and feel like they contributed in their day's work, that they did something valuable of value for themselves and to the company and the people whom they work with and the people whom they serve, that we've we've done a good job for the day. And so computers really scared people a lot. And so the way that I had grown up and didn't have any fear of the machines and had been, you know, playing around on BBSs and programming in basic and done all of that kind of stuff, it was like, oh, that was when I discovered that I had a knack for helping other people understand the and and help that transition right so equip and empower those who equip and empower others so i started figuring out that one of my superpowers is taking these complex concepts and and simplifying them and uh, i spent 10 years in law because of that uh because it was just waves and waves of automation that we had so again we got the hardware first and we got this the software um so dos and windows in particular then we got, um, I think back in the 90s, uh, as part of the IT department, again, when there was only 20 of us supporting this large firm in Chicago, uh, and, it, and Chicago was the head office, but we had, um, we had six offices around the United States at the time, and we had uh, two overseas, two in Europe, um, and they're much bigger now, actually. And so we had, even back then, we had 146 different applications that we had to uh, support. And one of the new things that had started coming in to law at the time, in addition to all of this other stuff that I've mentioned previously, was online legal research. So instead of having to go down to the physical library, to the law library, in order to do the research, the paralegals and the associates were suddenly able to access systems like Westlaw and LexisNexis online in order to be able to do their legal research. And here's the challenge that was happening in the 1990s with this, and this is really where it gets into HPT for me, and that was people were not set up for success. So, um, so the way that a law firm makes money is not only by providing billable work to clients, but also minimizing the amount of billable work that gets charged internally to the firm. So many here in the United States, uh, you know, because we think about many of the lawyer jokes, but law firms, the mega firms, really do bill, or at that time, bill in 10-minute increments. And the problem is, is that if somebody is not efficient in the way that they work, then you have this surplus or this overage of hours, and those hours have to be billed to some entity. And if they're not within the realm of what a partner thinks the client is going to be willing to pay for, then it gets charged internally. And if it gets charged internally, that gets charged against the partner 
profits. And that's a no-no. Your career does not last long in a law firm. They don't care that you were part of the 1% of law students graduating in the United States. They don't care how much it is that they've paid for you to actually be there. That is That takes you off the partner track. And at the time, the partner track was the only track, the only career progression for associates. So you had people in positions, right, who had spent their entire lives up until that point doing the right things in their academic careers in order to be courted by one of these large law firms and then have a job at a law firm. And you go to these law firms and you work your tail off because that's how the law firms profit. All of the, it's literally called, the actual business model in a law firm is called burden. And the way that a law firm makes money is that the burden of the work is actually put on the lowest billable resources. And all of your lowest billable resources are timekeepers that are sort of at the bottom of the food chain. And that would be your legal secretaries, your paralegals, and your associates. So associates are the people that have like just graduated from law school and are just coming into a firm for the first time. So... I had some very human needs at the time. I had, again, I was I was pretty new to Chicago. I had moved here um, for a, a job, This these consulting gigs that I was doing. A best friend, um, as a matter of fact, the same best friend who back in middle school, we'd been playing around with the Commodore 64 in order to do the voice synthesizer, and a man whom I did eventually marry. And so that was what brought me from Cleveland to Chicago. And I wanted to stay. And in order to stay, I had to make a living. And in order to make a living, I had to get the law firm at the time to renew my contract with the consulting firm that had me in there with. And so I was always looking for ways to provide value uh, in order to be able to keep the conditions right that I would be able to remain and live and work in Chicago. And so my boss at the time at the firm, who was the head of the training department, um, she had a need, and her need was that in a space in downtown Chicago, in the Chicago Loop, in the financial district, that office space, pretty expensive, even back in the 1990s, by square foot. And so if you've got a training room in that environment, then you need to be able to justify that they're paying for this space in order to provide it you know, as a, as a resource. And in Illinois at the time, you could also get a tax write-off. Um, you would get money for being able to show utilization of that space. So to please her and provide value to her, she was trying to fill classes in the training room in order to be able to keep the training room and in order to get her budget and what it is that she needed. So if I made her happy, then she would renew my contract. And so um, I saw these baby associates and paralegals that were struggling to use these new subscription services like Westlaw and LexisNexis, which at the time cost an enormous amount of money, right? And if you were inefficient in the way that you used it, it not only got charged your, your time, not only got charged back to the firm, which was a no-no, but it also wound up being these exorbitant um, monthly fees that they were paying for these online services. And so we used to bring into the firm, we would bring in trainers from these online legal research organizations to come in and provide training. But the problem that my boss had was she couldn't get people to come to class. And part of the constraints in a billable environment in any kind of professional services is they're billable resources and training is a non-billable activity. So if you're taking people off of billable work and you're going to put them into a non-billable activity, you've got to prove the value up front of what that training is going to provide that's going to make it worthwhile for those people to be off the clock, right? Because again, mm -hmm. burden, that's how the whole wheel spins is that whole business model itself for makes money. So what I figured out was, um, as kind of a crazy side gig was, again, remember, this was the 1990s, we didn't have computers at home. And so what was happening was many of the capital partners who are partners in a professional services firm like this law firm who have equity, they have their own money actually invested in the firm. And so when they divvy up partner profits at the end of a fiscal year, these are people that are getting money. You know, they're the ones that are sharing that wealth, right? And so these partners, the equity partners who were the heads of the practice areas too, um, 
so there is, you know, practice areas would be like environmental law or mergers and acquisition or litigation or labor and employment law, you know, these different um fiefdoms really but you mm-hmm. had these different practice heads over these different uh, lines of business we would call it in other environments and they started actually getting computers at home and because they had the money for it because computers at the time were thousands of dollars you yeah. couldn't go out and buy a chromebook for a couple hundred bucks you if you were going to get any kind of a desktop computer you it was going to be probably three grand at least and forget getting anything else along with it Um, like a printer or any of that kind of stuff. So they were buying these computers and they would take the box home or the box would come shipped and they didn't know how to set it up. And so I had this whole side gig going where these capital partners, I was the friendly IT person (laughs) that was looking to provide value. So I became the computer chick that they could call and have me come over to the house, set up the computer and then show them and their spouse, and oftentimes their kids, how to use this new device that they had just purchased. So I wound up with these crazy relationships and these crazy high-level connections within a law firm because of this side thing that was going on. So when I figured out the math on filling the training rooms and getting, and that there was this problem with Uh, people not being able to perform well in this new cyber environment of online legal research, I went to one of the capital partners and I, and I said, look, I need you to, you know, here's what I can do for you. You've got, and, and we had access at the time to the time and labor system. So that was the other thing was all of this, all of the data to me at the time was available. So I could set a baseline and then measure progress against that baseline So being able to have that data, have that information, a starting point, and then provide treatments or interventions, and then be able to monitor the difference and then tweak and make changes for continuous improvement, I had access to that. So I went to one of the heads, uh, one of the practice heads, one of the capital partners, and asked and said, look, here's what I can do. I'm going to need 18 of your associates. It doesn't matter to me which ones they are. I need them for 30 minutes to come to this training class. We've got a Westlaw trainer who's coming in to do blah, blah, blah. And I can guarantee you that there will be a this percentage of decrease because to me it was all low, low hanging fruit. I knew how to game the system because one of the biggest things that people didn't know how to do was do Boolean searches. They didn't know how to use an or or an and in order to be able to return results really quickly. And what I also learned was it wasn't just the performers, right, the people that were getting tripped up because they didn't have the competence or the confidence to work in these systems, it was also environmental constraints. So some people had internet problems. They, you know, because again, internet was brand new. We didn't really have high speed bandwidth at the time. We were just starting to get T1 lines. You know, we were just starting to get high speed bandwidth into the office environment. And so they would lose connectivity with the system or it would be really dog slow. And at the time, the longer you stayed connected to the database, the longer it kept charging. Well, people didn't even know that. The associates didn't even know that. We also had things where you had one associate who'd be very nice and, you know, there'd be like a new new associates that came and started in the fall. And you'd have, you know, somebody who was a little bit, you know, farther along, you know, was a two-year associate, would look at the first-year associate and say, hey, you don't have your credentials yet from the IT department to log in a Westlaw, go ahead and use mine. And had no idea how this person's lack of competence and lack of performance was (laughs) counting against them, and not only counting against them in the near term, but also their potential future success and making partner in the next five to seven years. Mm -hmm. And so that's really where HPT all came together for me was having an understanding of these different factors. And it was later on that I learned about the greats in the industry and all of the the body of work and the methodology around it. But um, yeah, I learned in that law firm an awful, an awful lot about how that whole performer and performance environment um, and human performance systems work and how it is that you can make some incremental changes that can have some great impact and fast results, big results really, really fast. That was a fantastic story. Thank you so much for sharing <laughs> all of that. That's exactly what I was looking for. <laughs> Um, and you've answered the, the next question, which was about your first exposure, but 
Um, let's let's go more formal than informal. So you kind of entered this world through logic and uh, from your background, but uh, I, I know that you've been uh, uh, very much associated with the Chicago chapter of ASTD now ATD. But so talk to us a little bit about your first formal exposure to this body of knowledge and practice that in the ISPI world is HPT, but in the ASTD, ATD world uh, was HPI. Yes. Wow. So, um, so another thing about my, my time in the 1990s was, um, so again, I was, at the, I was at the law firm under contract and I was a subcontractor uh, and I spent a lot of time as um, an independent um, and subcontracting. And it was like the 1990s, geez, they were pulling people off the street, including equestrian study majors, in order to teach computers because we just didn't, we didn't have that. And so just prior to the law firm gig, I mean, I was basically, um, I would learn uh, a software package the night before and go teach it the next day. So I would learn Harvard graphics. I mean, this is how far back that goes. It would be Lotus Notes. Um, I was well-versed in DOS. I would go and teach DOS classes. I taught Unix for a long time. So I had this um, dual role from the beginning, and that was straight-up tech uh, and being able to come in and help on the technology front. And I had um, also this role with then being able to address the human factors of technology adoption from the very beginning of my career. And so I see myself as an IT person who came up to learning and performance through IT rather than through HR. Mm -hmm. And that has certainly shaped and informed um, my uh, perspective on a lot of on a lot of things, including my involvement later on with ASTD. So uh, when I eventually, when the contract ended with the law firm, so I kept that going for about two and a half years. But I would work in a law firm during the day, and I would go out to this consulting firm that I was with, and I would do programming at night. And we were doing a lot of programming, a lot of programming in Lotus Notes at the time. We were doing a lot in Visual Basic. We were doing a lot. Um, and then we started getting web browsers and we started having JavaScript and these other types of things. And, and actually, one of the first uh, programming projects that I worked on was for uh, Manpower. And what we were doing with Manpower International was we were uh, working with them across the United States. They were putting in their local area networks for the first time ever and their wide area networks for the first time ever. And so think about that. Like you had this staffing firm who at the time, by the way, their bread and butter at Manpower was by staffing factory workers and by staffing um, secretaries and office workers, right? So a lot of women would go to Manpower in order to get a secretarial job or get some kind of a clerical job. And a lot of men were going to Manpower in order to get temporary jobs in factories, and so Manpower was putting in wide area networks and local area networks for the first time, as were many people. And the team that I was on, we actually created a project management tool that could handle 40,000 tasks a month. And so Manpower was using Lotus Notes as their front end at the time, but on the back end, through some VB code and some fancy processing that we had with uh, then it was Microsoft Access, and we were doing things in early, early versions of Microsoft Project, um, would do all the calculations and so on and so forth and help the project managers that had these responsibilities to roll out um, this kind of technology to manpower offices around the United States. Now, that plays into things because, again, that was a very technical role. Um, and I wound up, because of that, I, I, I wound up working on a whole bunch of other crazy types of technology projects. So I worked on some of the first shopping carts. I actually worked on the first L.L. Bean. So L.L. Bean actually was one of the first um, actual e-commerce um, sites. And I had all kinds of geeky um, technology certifications at 1.2, like in um, huge database systems like DB2. If you've never heard of DB2 before, it's a database system that actually runs banks. I mean, so that's, and ATMs. Um, so yeah, I used to be certified in all of that because I used to work in that environment. And when I left the firm, I went and actually took a job at Xerox. Um, and I had been at that time kind of subbing, I was like a sub of a sub of a sub and then wound up um, at Xerox. Uh, and Xerox and IBM had kind of this crazy partnership that was going on at the time, and I was working on all these different projects. And so when I joined professional associations earlier in my career, it was IT stuff. 
So I was at, you know, the Microsoft user group and, you know, project, Microsoft project user groups. And, you know, I hung out with Lotus, you know, Lotus Notes people and Domino people and, you know, and that kind of thing. And so when I went to Xerox, I came in as a dual resource. I came in as an IT person. And I also came in as, um, as a matter of fact, I was, my official title was, um, senior programming specialist, senior application specialist. And so I had um, straight up IT consulting gigs, but we were also building the distance education practice at Xerox for the first time. And so that whole manpower thing that I had worked on beforehand actually suddenly also became my first e-learning project in 1996. So they had 1,600 offices, and the way that people learned back then, um, the customer service representatives who handled both the onboarding of the customers and the onboarding of the staffing, right? So the factory workers that they were hiring and the clerical and secretarial workers that they were hiring and then placing at these um, different uh, organizations at these different companies, the CSR, the customer service reps at Manpower, had to handle both. And the way that they got trained, because again, we were just in the process of putting in, you know, they were just putting in networks. The way that they had gotten trained at the time was actually, if you were lucky, you got um, literally, it was a cart of binders and books, and you got to sit in a room by yourself and go through all of that material. And if you survived that experience for six months and stuck it out as a CSR and figured out how to do the candidate intake process and figured out how to manage these crazy customers and demands on all sides, if you were a performer who performed well in that environment, then they would fly you out to corporate in Milwaukee, which is just north of me here, of course, about a 90-minute drive. And um, you would go into, the CSRs would go into this training class and they would kind of level up. And it was awesome. Well, they wanted to, they wanted to sort out, you know, they wanted to take all of this analog materials, all of these books and these carts and so on and so forth. And they wanted to turn that into e-learning for the first time, which was really pretty funny because we didn't really have connectivity for e-learning um, quite yet. And so I wound up, uh, that was how I wound up with e-learning and started marrying this whole um, technology and leveraging technology to provide learning in addition to training people on technology. And that's how things started to spin. And that's what eventually brought me in the late 1990s to ASTD. So I came up in IT at the time that IT was just becoming a thing. Um, and we eventually went from, I mean, the law firm went from 20 people to, I think, 200 people uh, IT people supporting the law firm, you know, across the board in in a pretty rapid, um, uh, pretty rapidly over that period of time at that time in the 1990s. And for me, it was normal to then look for a professional association because I had gotten that into my head with IT was I always looked for technology associations. And so I joined the local chapter and I was one of those people that joined the local chapter and had it on my resume and had it on my CV as a, again, because I was a consultant, um, but didn't actually get involved with doing anything, right? So I, I, I didn't really come to events and I didn't whatever because I was busy doing all this other technology stuff. Um, and eventually what happened was I took um, a job. Every once in a while, I'd get a client that would offer me a job that I kind of couldn't refuse. And I went into a law firm. I took a job in a law firm. I got invited in to come in and lead their e-learning uh, and putting in a learning management system for the first time. And this was back in the year 2000. And again, it was a dual role because they didn't have enough. We didn't have enough electronic or e-learning work yet or on-demand um, work yet. So I still worked as um, in the IT department uh, and the training function came up through the IT department. And so I was a quality assurance specialist and I was testing all of this um, software. And there are funny stories about that for another time. But uh, and that got me into quality, that got me into risk, that got me into um, technology and testing, that got me into a whole bunch of things there. And that really shaped my experience and my career. And then I got into this side of, you know, how do we continue to leverage technology in order to in order to help people perform better, right, in their particular roles. So one thing led to another over that. And eventually what happened was I wound up 
um, exiting that job eventually and started Owl's Ledge in 2003. Uh, for a lot of reasons, but probably one that's probably familiar to a lot of people uh, and is significant in my life, and that is I left a bad boss. I left an abusive boss, and I decided that, you know, again, I, I kind of went back to, um, you know, even in 2003, it wasn't socially acceptable, especially as a woman who suddenly had this career in corporate America to not want that. And to exit. And um, that was a big deal. Like that was like a, it was um, not quite the scarlet letter, but I mean, it was, um, it, and it's funny, Guy, I've actually been thinking about this lately and some of the things that I've been talking about on social media. Like if, if we go back and look at some of the movies that defined the 1980s, like if you go back and look at, you know, Sigourney Weaver and uh, Harrison Ford in the movie Working Girl, you know, Working Girl is all about, you know, the, the image of women in corporate America at the time that I was coming into being a young woman was you you participated in corporate America in one of two ways. You were either the bombshell blonde and you were accidentally mistaken as somebody else and, you know, got in with the handsome guy who helped you along in your career or you were the, you know, apologies for the bad word, but you were the ball busting bitch. Right. So which is the Sigourney Weaver character in that particular movie. And the whole movie is about these secretaries that are part of this typist pool in the 1980s that are trying to figure out how to how to navigate these social and um, organizational and gender dynamics at the time. So for me in 2003, so this isn't that long afterwards in 2003 that I suddenly find myself that I'm leaving. And my father is like kind of losing his mind. He's like, what are you doing? You know, he's of a generation where you go in and you work for an organization and you put in your dues and that's for decades. And then you retire and you get the gold watch and the pension and I'm the eldest of the kids. And he was like, what, you know, what is happening? You know, what is happening here? So when I started Almost Ledge as a company, it was, I needed a company to work for because I was never going to allow myself to be subjected to the performance abuse of a boss like that again, mm -hmm. who had um, put my livelihood at risk, who had put my promotional and my career at risk. And I was just never going to allow that kind of vulnerability again. But I needed to have this structure around me um, that made me feel like I was working for somebody. And so my original intent of Owl's Ledge, even though it was uh, really meant to be what I would call now a lifestyle company, um, later on became a business, uh, meaning more than a solopreneur, right? So more than just Trish Yule, it was something that I've uh, built to be more than just me, but it didn't start that way. It actually, it actually started really quite by accident. And of course, there's all sorts of stories there. But it was at that time that I realized that I really wanted to go back into doing more of the training and doing more of the e-learning because the rest of the world was starting to catch up. And this became a way that I was able to make a living. And um, so that was how I started. I showed up at an ASD event in Chicago and um, wound up, uh, it's, a, it's a funny story, um, but I wound up in a lady's room. Again, I think many of the women on this uh, who watch this will appreciate this. I wound up in the lady's room and in the lady's room, there was a woman in there who was crying and um, she was very upset. And I was like, wow, like, I'm really very sorry. Like, how can I help you? Like, da, da, da. And anyway, that, that turned into this like whole conversation. Um, and it turned out that she was on the board of directors at the time and was really, really very frustrated and was in the ladies' room having this emotional reaction to some of these dynamics that were happening with the board of directors at the time. Um, and it started this um, it started this relationship. And so we wound up getting this like immediate bond, like we as women often do over these types of emotional types of things. And uh, soon after we uh, met for coffee and that person, she she this story is old. Um, was Donna Steffi, who is the president of the Chicago chapter of the American Society for Training and Development, CCASTD at the time. And so that was how Donna and I met, and that was how I got sucked in. So I tell people all the time, be careful who you have coffee with. Um, and women, be careful who you cry tears with, because it winds up with this connection. 
So I, I wind up again, I, I wound up going to this, you know, this event, it was a Cracker Barrel over at Ace Hardware, and it was sort of by accident, accident, right, that I wound up there and had this, you know, uh, interaction with Donna and had this bonding experience, then met for coffee afterwards. And, and I had no intention of getting any more involved with the organization. It was just sort of a one off thing for me. And she called me not that long after this was 2004. And she called me out that long after, and she said, you know what, we're running the CCAS to the Education Summit on um, this coming Saturday at Loyola University in downtown Chicago. And Trish, I really, I just, I need to get the numbers up. And she said, Tony Bingham is coming in from national, from national headquarters out in Alexandria. We need to have a certain number of people in the room in order to make it of value for Tony as the president and CEO of ASTD to be there. And I, I just, I need people to come. And I was like, yeah, you know, it's Saturday. I'm not going to schlep all the way down to Chicago. And, ah, da, da, da. and she goes, Allison Rossett is the opening keynote. And she goes, I think I remember you telling me that you're a fan of Alison Rossett. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> I was like, you are kidding me. So I was like, all right, well, I have to go see Alison Rossett. And that event changed the trajectory of my life. Um, so thank you, Donna. And thank you, Allison. So the quick story on that is that was October 4th of 2004. And what happened at that event was two things that happened. Number one, Allison gave an amazing keynote, um, which actually I've been referencing lately. Uh, and that keynote that she talked about was work that she had done at that point with the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, and it was one of the first case studies on really being able to leverage technology in a new way. And that was to get into the actual performance environment, into the actual operating environment and it fundamentally, profoundly changed the way that we could design training. I would even say it's it's the inception point at which we started being able to design learning solutions because we suddenly not only had access to people in the training environment, but we suddenly had technology that allowed us to get ahead of them in their actual work environment, in the operating environment. And that technology were PDAs. It was Palm Pilots at the time. And uh, the work that she did with the Coast Guard, she gave this whole case study. And again, this was October of 2004. And she talked about, um, and, and again, from my IT days, I've always thought of training in terms of risk, right? So how do we make decisions about what investments we make into modalities of training delivery? It's based on risk, which of course has to do with assessment and evaluation. So for instance, I'm not going to do a scuba class that's entirely online and just give people a knowledge check and then sign off, right? Yeah. And just be like, oh, okay, you can dive. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm willing as an instructor to go ahead and take that risk of life and limb to you and to my reputation and just sign off. No, you have to actually show up in the pool and you have to actually perform under observation of a professional before anybody's you can have that assessment of your skills before anybody's going to sign off and clear you to do a deep water dive. So I always thought of risk. And in the case of um, what Allison was talking about with the Coast Guard was they were inspectors and the Coast Guard has to inspect a bunch of different watercraft. At the time, I think it was 220 some odd different watercraft. And it could be anything from like a little Zodiac dinghy, right? From somebody from, I always picture somebody from Greenpeace going out to like, you know, watch <laughs> whales. Yeah. Um, all the way up to, you know, aircraft carriers or cruise ships or, you know, these massive, um, you know, these massive ships. And what people needed to learn um, versus what people needed to look up. And I, and I want to do a shout out to David Grusenmeyer, who I'm a huge fan, who's one of my friends and colleagues from um, long ago in my law firm days. And it was David who said to me, you know what, Trish, there's two types of knowledge. There's what you know, and there's what you can get access to. And this was exactly that example and, and what we're seeing now in social networks as well. But what I mean, back to Allison in 2004, was the Coast Guard agents, the inspectors, they needed to know the process. They needed to know and execute the inspection process in the operating environment, right? So whether they were 
standing on a dinghy or standing on a cruise ship, they needed to be able to actually perform the inspection and they needed to be able to learn how to do that and do that well. But what they could look up were the specifics about that type of watercraft that they happened to be on. And the thing that made it possible for them to look that up was the Palm Pilot. So they suddenly had information at their fingertips in their work environment that they didn't have access to before that became a performance support tool that helped them perform that job. And how that radically and fundamentally changed training from that point forward and design and delivery, as Allison was talking about back then, was we no longer had to try and shoehorn that, you know, those details of 200 and some uh, different vessels into people's heads and give them five ring binders that they exited this formal training class with. We could look at the risk. What's the consequence of them not knowing how to perform or not being able to perform these inspections in the work environment? And then because it was high risk, right, because they're the first line of defense and they need to be able to, you know, approve these watercraft coming into U.S. waters and so on and so forth, there's high risk there. And so high risk meant that it made sense for the Coast Guard to spend money to still bring people together into an instructor-led environment to teach them and have them practice, rehearse the process, learn the process, but they could look this other stuff up um, and just really huge. So that was one of the first things that happened at that event. The second part that happened at that event was Tony Bingham was there. And he did deliver his keynote, and in October of 2004 at Loyola University at the CCASTD uh, Education Summit is where Tony announced the existence of the Certified Professional in Learning and Performance, the CPLP certification. And so in October of 2004, when he announced the certification, Donna and I were in the audience together with some of the other um, leadership from the local chapter at the time, and we made a commitment right then and there that we would get involved with the upcoming pilot that Tony then also announced that was going to start spring of 2005. Um, And the reason why I had an idea about certification was, remember my IT certifications, But also at the time, I had gotten my project management professional certification, my PMP certification back in 2003 as a get your geek on IT project manager. Um, Because I, you know, at the time had also been doing software development projects and managing, you know, really, really um, complicated IT and technology projects. But I understood and had been in IT before it became a culture of certification. And so I saw what the possibilities were in being able to bring this kind of certification and qualification into the training function and into the training industry. And again, both of those things really at that point in time um, changed the trajectory of my life. Very cool. Very cool. Mm. So so that was your formal introduction. It was at the, the Chicago chapter, and Allison Reset and Tony Bingham kind of brought that to you and, and introduced you to CPLP, which is basically the formalization of human performance improvement, human performance technology. True? Um, from a yes. learning standpoint, from a, from a, a training standpoint. Yeah, it, it, you know what, it really is. And it's funny because I, you know, I spent the next 12 years making a living doing exactly that and, and um, upskilling L&D teams around the world for organizations around the world from exactly that kind of vantage point. And it, it's kind of funny because I, even though I didn't know it at the time, I, I, I know it and I've known for quite some time that, um, you know, as you know, ISPI and ASCD at one point had gone together in creating the certified performance technologist, the yes. CPT, and then ASTD backed out. And there was a lot of bad blood and probably still is some bad blood between those two organizations, which has um, caused a divide in many ways uh, because of the that relationship and the um, what happened in that relationship around that. And there are some Um, There are some who believe that the CPLP actually, you know, was created as a competitive product um, against CPT, uh, and that may or may not be true. 
But what I do know at the time was the strategic purpose of the CPLP, the Certified Professional in Learning and Performance, which I don't know if this was ever the strategic purpose of the CPT. And the CPT, let me be clear, I love as a certification. Look, I'm sitting in Wheaton, Illinois right now. Judy Hale is two da- two towns yep. down the way from me, and I'm a huge fan. And, um, and actually, anyway, so... CPT, um, I don't know that CPT was ever part of this, but CPLP was actually something that ASTD at the time that the board had decided was going to be used with the Department of Labor here in the U.S. to get learning and performance actually recognized as a profession. And what many people don't know is that here in the United States, in order to have professional status, it requires having a credentialing program. And so that was the strategic purpose of the CPLP. There's actually five things that are required, but a certification program is one of them. And so I eventually wound up, I mean, I I wound up on Capitol Hill. I wound up meeting with, I mean, I, so I wound up all in. So not only part of chapter leadership, but was uh, part of the wave of actually getting the CPLP. We were successful in getting the CPLP and the ASTD competency model actually recognized by the Department of Labor um, uh, that's no longer the case, and that's uh, a story for another day. But at the time, we were able to do that, and we were trying to do it in time for the 2010 census because we wanted people in the United States that were practitioners in learning and performance. Um, we wanted people to be able to like actually have that as an you know have that as a profession that they could mark on the census right. and actually have be, people be counted for that. And there's a number of reasons for that. Not only not only status, you know, profession versus occupation, and I mean from a very technical term, but also professions in the United States have access to resources like money, um, and uh, we wanted to be able to tap into that money to be able to um, fund things like the GI Bill, to be able to fund things like people in transition. So whenever training departments got laid off, how could we help? Um, get federal funding to develop people in the profession to be able to get them back to work again. Um, And we were able to do that for a a period of time. But I I wound up working actually in my CPLP prep practice, which is a lot of what people think about when they think about me or think about Owl's Ledge, people that have heard of either entity before myself or Owl's Ledge, and that is the uh, CPLP. But CPLP was never about just certification and having you know, letters after your name for me, it was a a means of being able to keep people in work and to keep people to raise the standards to a level of quality that were repeatable, measurable, scalable, um, and to help bring the entire community forward. Um, And I wound up working and had the privilege and pleasure of working with a lot of military folks who wound up using the CPLP as a way of being able to get reimbursed. Um, So Owl's Ledge never received any of the federal money that went into CPLP. Um, That money at the time was paid to ASTD, but uh, military veterans that were coming out of uh, the active duty and coming into the civilian workforce for the first time were able to use CPLP as a way to get their work in training um, mm-hmm. actually recognized within um, organizations that otherwise didn't understand how to translate their extensive military career or military experience and be able to um, get past the hiring managers to have an understanding of how they could provide value to the organizations. And that was significant at the time because 2009, summer of 2009 was the first time in United States history that we had so many military veterans coming out of active duty and into the civilian workforce for the first time that it was the largest talent pool of potential senior managers that we had ever had in this country. And so being able to get them into work and help them bridge the gap with um, being able to get recognized for the military careers was was a really big deal. So, thank you. Yeah. Yes, that. Uh, so, uh, uh, a couple of notes. Um, the the chasm between the two organizations, ISPI and ASTD, is uh, goes back decades. And uh, yes, I was on the board of ISPI when we approved uh, uh, getting Judy Hale to create the CPT. And yep. I was uh, then again on the board after that when I was a president-elect and then moving on to president where Judy came back and told us that ASTD had hired her to work on their certification. So they knew in advance that ASTD would pull away from uh, uh, oh, currently okay. sponsoring CPT. 
Uh, and another thing about the CPT is that when it first came around, we said, okay, this is kind of very general. You can do improvement, but there's these niches like training or like Lean Six Sigma or whatever, different ways to affect performance. Um, and there was discussion at one time about having kind of a merit badge system where you'd get your CPT and then you'd get some sort of a designation for these specialty areas. And that was right. the, one of the promises that was never uh, felt. But uh, yeah, so there's always been this uh, competitive thing between the two organizations, which is often silly. And uh, when I was uh, uh, president of, uh, of the uh, society, I was able to invite uh, John Coné, who is the president of HSTD and who I had worked with at Motorola back in mm -hmm. the Chicago suburbs way back in the day in the early 80s, and asked him to come to ISPI to present and to try to bridge the gap between the two organizations and talk about how we overlap a little bit, but we have different areas of focus, and uh, it right. should be okay. Um, but anyway, um, thank you for, well, for your stories. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, no, I was going to, and so, it, um, so I've, I've, I've never become CPT myself, uh, and that has, um, and I've often thought about it, and, and at one point in my career would have liked to have done it, because uh, it would have served me well, um, and that's not to say that that certification doesn't serve now, it absolutely is a fantastic certification, it's a fantastic process to go through, and I highly, highly, highly recommend the CPT, the Certified Performance Technologist. Um, but I had actually been for a long time a longstanding member of both ISPI uh, of uh, International mm -hmm. was uh, a member, and then later on had the privilege. So in the practice that I did with CPLP, I wound up bringing CPLP and the ASTD competency framework to five out of seven continents, and that wasn't just um, that was also in country, right? So at the time that I had at the highest peak of Owl's Ledge. Uh, starting its own practice around CPLP prep and really leveraging the competency model to create these elite and high-performing um, learning and performance teams. We were actually doing business in continent or um, in country uh, on multiple continents and working with reseller partners and so on and so forth and building facilitator branches. And so one of those was actually, um, so I partnered with Alwyn Klein who is uh, actually notable for a number of reasons and one of my performance improvement and performance consulting heroes of all time. And Owen and I, he's the one who brought qualifications to the continent of Africa and was in Johannesburg, South Africa at the time. And um, so what we would do and what I often did with organizations and with learning leaders like Owen is we would use CPLP as the general and it would get people like CPLP certified and then people would figure out their specialty. And so some people would go for their CPT or some people would go for their ICF for their coaching certification or whatever discipline that they really wanted to drill down deep into. But CPLP would be the baseline. And we would use what used to be part of the CPLP certification process, the practicum, the work product, which is kind of akin to the CPT yeah. certification process overall, where you actually have to not only perform the work and demonstrate and provide evidence of, but you also have to reflect on the work that you've done and be able to articulate it, mm -hmm. um, which is a huge uh, process that we should know as learning professionals, um, that reflection and being able to think about our work and be able to articulate it uh, is, is huge on a number of levels. But Alwyn actually uh, is notable for not only bringing qualifications in the training field to the continent of Africa, but also actually had um, his team in Johannesburg at the time was the largest population of CPTs outside of North America. <laughs> so to have been a part of that and to help enable that um, and to bring, it took us four years. It took us four years to, pe to petition ASTD to even put a pilot uh, program together um, to be able to have, because the problem was in order to do the CPLP, the first part of it which is a knowledge exam, you had to fly into a proctored exam center. And for a number of years, the only proctored exam centers were in North America. They were in the United States and in Canada. Mm -hmm. And so globally, people just couldn't afford to do that, like all went. And so it took us four years to petition ASTD in order to even do a pilot in Johannesburg, a pilot exam center. And then we did that. And then um, the rest is uh, kind of history there. But to work with learning leaders of that kind of caliber, 
uh, has been amazing. And that was actually when I started meeting other people. Um, so Darlene Van Team was actually one of my CPLPs. Um, Carol Susan Devaney was one of my CPLPs. And this is this is where my formal education of things that I had kind of fallen into, where I started learning about this rich body of work and and these amazing um, people. I've often said that we stand on the shoulder of giants, which of course, uh, you know, is the old is the old quote. Um, and, and we do. And and this is guy, and I just have to say is one of my favorite things about you and your work is, this bringing all these legacies and this rich body of work and all of these amazing people forward um, in methods like this, right? Of being able to shoot like the legacy series and stuff like that. So that people that are coming into the field, that people that are practicing in the field right now, there's continuity, there's community, there's a long, rich history. You come from a rich and amazing past that features um, some of the best, um, some of some people that I've met that have been some of the best humans uh, on the planet. So um, anyway, I had to say all of that at that particular juncture. Well, we are in one of the helping professions. Um, Yes. So you've, you've covered some of this, but uh, um, what I want for new people coming into the field to uh, watch a video like this is to get pointed to some resources, people, books, articles, so can you name uh, some of those that uh, you would recommend, not to necessarily the more advanced people in the, in the profession, but the people starting off here? What was uh, helpful for you? Yeah, a couple of, um, a few different things. Uh, so off the, um, just thinking about this for a moment. So the, the first thing before um, talking about resources, and that is, one of the things about going around the world and um, helping practitioners really learn how to apply a competency framework like the what was the ASTD competency framework at the time, which we then started to actually, in my practice, I started bringing in other models. The thing about that is, was um, just even listing everything that was in the competency model at the time, just when you took the areas of expertise and broke them down into like, oh, okay, what's actually in there? was 36 pages long Mm -hmm. and learning all of that and and not only learning it from a point of view of being able to recall it but but actually learning how to apply six sigma to my work actually being able to learn how to apply hpi um actually being able to uh you know learn integrated talent management and change management um, and take things that I had already intuitively mm-hmm. had come to in some cases and in some cases had no awareness of and was able to add to my skill set, to my mindset, to my my tool set and 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 weave together this practice, this multidisciplinary practice. I would encourage um, others, especially those starting in the field, to start with that broader perspective. Mm-hmm. And I remember a, a story, actually, that Tiagi talks about, which, again, another one of my fa- all-time favorite performance folks um, and ISPI folks. And and Tiagi, I remember him talking, uh, I think it was about leadership development, and he was there at a client, and he was teaching this leadership development class, which just makes me laugh. If you haven't ever seen Tiagi yeah. speak, <laughs> go see Tiagi. Um, and he basically had everybody, like, after they left the, um, the event that day, they all had to take a magazine with them of some crazy topic that they would have never thought, like, you know, it would have been, like, yarn and knitting and bowling and, you know, these different magazines that had absolutely nothing to to do, or at least seemingly so, to do with whatever the immediate topic was at hand. And his instructions were, the activity was that people had to take the magazine and they had to come back to class the next day. And they had to be able to take something from this entirely different subject matter and whatever it was, hobby, discipline, whatever, you know, it was like car mechanics and also the kind of stuff, mechanics magazines, And they had to be able to come back and they had to be able to take something that they could then apply it to the topic at hand. I'm pretty sure it was leadership development. And I thought that was brilliant, as many of Tiagi's activities are. And that is because we have to get out of this echo chamber of seeing ourselves as 
you know, just being in this straight and narrow lane, that we can take these rich experiences that we've had from whatever kind of crazy background and past you've come from that has wound up leading you here into learning and performance, that there's so much that we can draw from from these other disciplines and that we should. Um, and so, so resources for me are often not just things that are what I would consider things within the learning and performance world or specific to learning and performance. It's a much more broad perspective than that. Um, the second thing on that that I want to say real quick is this is a multidisciplinary practice, regardless of what you identify with. So if you identify as an ATD person, that's fabulous. If you identify as an ISPI person, that's fabulous. If you see yourself as being part of ICF, that's fabulous. But if you have an understanding of how these things interlock and integrate together, you don't have to become an expert in all of them, but having an understanding of how these things affect people in the way that they work and organizations in the way that they work, then um, then you have a better view on things and that's gonna put you ahead of the other people that are in this practice time and time again. And one of the rabbit holes that we fall down into is part of the industrial age organizational design. And that is we've been brought up to think of ourselves in a particular function, in a particular role, rather than multifunctional roles across a process. And if you think more about process and you think, and this goes into, you and I have a lot of shared history here with um, uh, total quality management and applying that to the learning function and to performance improvement and systems thinking and and thinking of things as an engineer versus thinking of things as a learning perspective person. But if you think about the continuum and what that journey looks like and how many different cross functions somebody goes through in a process that we call training, that's going to that's gonna serve you if you can take more of that um, you people out there in, yeah. the, in the cyberverse. Not you, guy, you've got a really excellent handle on this. Um, so, oh, I have turned out my light. Um, so basically... Uh, there's a number of different resources that I would highly that I would highly recommend, and I would use it from the frame of going back to ISPI for a moment. So one of my favorite things with ISPI has always been the different views. So world, mm -hmm. work, um, workplace, and then worker. And I augmented that framework um, some time ago. So I think of things in terms of what's happening in the world, what's happening in the workplace, what's happening with work what's happening with workflow, what's happening with the workforce, and then what's happening with the worker. And then how do you maintain a perspective across those different areas, mm -hmm. the Ws, in order to be able to apply that to your, your practice? Um, I would start, number one, above all else, to mine everything that this man right here has actually compiled for you in this treasure trove of HPT. So Guy himself comes from a very varied background across a number of different disciplines and actually is a, a huge role model in what it is that I'm saying, and that is having these different lenses and being able to go back and watch these videos that Guy has created, especially, what, over the past 10 years? Yeah, 2008? it started in 2008. Um, and being able to, like, actually be able to um, mine all of that rich history and those types of resources, that would be a great place to start. And then I would look at things outside of our um, profession. I would look at especially what are things that are forces that are happening in the world today. Um, I would certainly look at technology. That's a, that's a big thing that we talk about. But I would also take a look at what's happening with other types of drivers like globalization, right? So if you look at the number of people that are coming online, if you look at, I mean, so right now, um, the Middle East and Africa, only 29% of that population is online. What happens when it's closer to saturation point of 90 some odd percent like we are here in North America? How does that change the game? What impact that do, does that have as more and more of the seven plus billion heading rapidly to eight billion humans um, and three plus billion being in the workforce? How does that impact us? Right. So so again, having that world perspective and that broader perspective and then looking at resources, some of my own work. Uh, right now is in um, emerging technologies and in maturing technologies. So things like artificial intelligence, 
things like ambient intelligence, things like um, Internet of Things, and other also called IoT, um, 5G connectivity, uh, blockchain. How are those things starting to really come into impacting the learning function? Um, how is it giving us more access into the performance or the operating environment? So it's kind of like, you know, going back to Allison in 2004 and the Coast Guard, um, how are those devices and access to new sources of data giving us more visibility into what's happening in those human performance systems and giving us the ability of being able to provide treatments or interventions, suites of them, integrated suites of them faster and do it in much more of a preventative and a proactive kind of way rather than what has traditionally been a very reactive uh, and in hindsight kind of way. How can we how can we use it to get ahead of it? Um, and I've got a ton of stuff that's out there. I think my LinkedIn profile is uh, a good place to start if you want to see some of the free articles and videos and so on and so forth. We just, um, uh, I was just at Learning Technologies uh, UK in London. I gave one session on uh, learning analytics, so analytics applied to the learning function. And I, I don't talk about the traditional stuff, which is usually people trying to figure out how to use analytics to prove their value instead of improving their value, right? So how do we improve to ensure that we're providing value instead of using it as a stick to, you know, to justify our existence within the organization? It's the wrong frame. So we need it to be able to use it to ensure that we're providing value. So how do we use analytics was one of the sessions. And in that session, I get into ambient intelligence and what does it, what is ambient intelligence and what does it mean and how does it apply to the um, workforce? And even if you're just starting in the profession, I would say to take a look at that. So that recording is now up just as of earlier this week. And then there's a second session that I did on artificial intelligence applied to the learning function. Actually, this was kind of crazy. I actually jumped in. Um, uh, Gene Meister was supposed to do a session and was uh, wound up um, not being able to speak at the conference and I jumped in last minute and delivered the um, session. So there's a little bit of Jean's uh, research that I referenced there and she's got some great articles out on Forbes. Um, but Jean tends to talk about the broader perspective of like AI applied to HR across the board rather than to learning specifically. Um, I drill down into, uh, you know, what's happening around the world with um, artificial intelligence applied to L&D. And there's a brand new video out on YouTube under that. And there's a whole series that I've got actually on HR Zone um, that's available, uh, an article series on analytics applied to the learning function. So how do you get started? Like, what's it all about? What can you do with the discipline of analytics? Um, you know, do we start with data? Do we start with questions? How do you, you know, how do you have conversations? How do you figure out what your baseline is? I'm big on baseline progress, iterations, agility, being able to make progress, incremental success, big impact over time. Uh, and so I've got a whole article series that's based on that. And then also um, there's an article out there that I did with uh, David Green, um, who exited last year. David was in charge of talent analytics at uh, IBM, um, or people analytics at IBM, and now uh, David's, uh, David's all around the world. And he and I did uh, work together on an article last year also about analytics and um, AI applied to the learning function. So those are some um, places to, ooh, and one more. Um, I also had the pleasure of working with uh, George uh, Lawton, who's a longtime Silicon Valley technology journalist. Uh, and he and I worked on an article together last year, too, on artificial intelligence uh, applied to employee development. How do we use AI in order to upskill employees? Uh, and basically, that um, article's out on Tech Target. And it basically goes into, so this whole idea of uh, creating consumer grade learning experiences, like being able to personalize learning to the individual, um, being able to, you know, tailor the environment to create these fast feedback loops like Josh Burson talks about. How do we leverage these types of tools and technologies in order to be able to do that? That's what that whole article with George is all about. Is that helpful? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Well, as a, as a lifelong learner, so what's next? What are you focused on in learning for yourself? And um, are you then writing or presenting on, uh, planning on writing or presenting on that? 
Yeah, so I've had a couple of books actually in progress um, right now. One is on um, analytics and the other, and I think that one's going to morph into more about ambient intelligence because that's really the direction that places that, um, that things are going to now. I'm really excited about some of the work that I'm doing um, right now with Mars Inc., um, which is the, I didn't know this at the time uh, until I started with them, but they're the third largest uh, food manufacturer in the world. Um, and we're embedding analytics into the performance environment in order to create these feedback loops to figure out how well people are performing in a variety of um, different uh, work environments. So office environments, as well as on the factory floor. Um, and that all has to do with a huge technology and business process uh, transformation project that we're implementing around the world. And so again, um, we're trying to get ahead of where are the performance issues? How do we leverage technology and data in order to get notified that there's a problem? It may not necessarily tell us exactly what the meaning is or what the problem is, but it gives us kind of what I call the flag on the field, right? Mm -hmm. It gives us a place to start the diagnostic, to be able to take a closer look and figure out what's um, hindering people and also in some cases what's helping people so that we can use that and cascade that out. Uh, and that's really exciting because... Um, just a, a thing and in, in thinking about the broader context of what's happening in the world one of the things that i would encourage everybody on this video to do is to go back and take a look at something that was announced by microsoft at microsoft ignite their uh, big event at the end of last year and that is this whole idea of how microsoft changed their strategy in 2014 they changed their entire data strategy um, in order to be able to support ambient intelligence. And what that means is the back end of every Microsoft product now actually is in the cloud on Azure, which means that all the data is mixed up together. Now they have, you know, it's it's in the aggregate. They have their, you know, they have their um, uh, walls in place, of course. They're not mixing up. Um, people, you know, people don't have access or inappropriate access to other people's data, customer data. That's not what I'm saying. But they're able to use this really rich data set. Um, if you think of this huge ocean of data, so data coming in from their productivity tools, from their servers, from and they're using that in, in order to power these um, really high powered AI driven analytics. And now what they've done, what they announced at Microsoft Ignite last year is that data strategy that they started in 2014 where they restructured all of their technology to share data on the back end. They've now invited SAP and they've also now invited Adobe. So Adobe, SAP and Microsoft have started what's called the Open Data, uh, Open Data Initiative, so ODI. And basically what that means is we suddenly have access to data that's happening in one type of work environment, right? So anybody who's an office worker who works in those tools and especially across those tools, Microsoft, SAP, and um, Adobe, what are the ways that we can now be able to leverage that data and the discipline of analytics and tools like AI that really kind of take that onto an intergalactic hike um, and be able to process that or near real time in order to get ahead of these performance challenges and help people improve what they're doing and how they're doing and help provide better support in the moment in real time. So some really exciting things that are um, happening there. So the things that I'm talking about now um, at a bunch of different events are around those kinds of possibilities. How do we embed analytics within the performance environment? How do we have access to these different work environments? In other words, performance environments. How do we be able to use that in order um, to do predictive and even prescriptive in some ways? How do we move up the maturity scale in an analytics practice and be able to provide um, more support to the business and to people? Um, one of the big things that I'm uh, passionate about and and know that there are many before me that have said this too, and that is, and you know, Rumler was uh, big on this, and that is you can't get business results at the expense of the people. So we need to be able to use these tools and use the disciplines in our multidisciplinary approach in order to benefit the people as well as to provide the business results. So how do we make what we've always, I think, wanted to do in this profession? Um, how do we have 
meaningful contribution to the organizations that we serve and the results that they're trying to generate and the outcomes against the mission that they're trying to bring into the world? And how do we provide people impact, positive people impact in meaningful ways? And I think, you know, there are really some amazing tools that are available now uh, in order to get us there. And and I'm really delighted to be able to write about that and to be able to speak about that and, and meet with people around those types of opportunities. Cool. Very cool. One of the questions that I had uh, forwarded to you asked uh, if you had a favorite, uh, I, I termed it as an HPT term, but a business term, a performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us uh, perhaps because you feel the way it's being used is problematic or you'd like to clarify and give your spin for it. What what term or phrase might you share with us? It's the word training. Okay. And so training, um, so the reason why training, because it's, it's so commonly used and it's so commonly used as a term incorrectly. And people go, well, can you really define training? Yes, yes, you can. Training is an intervention. It's one tool in a larger toolbox. And it's only appropriate for closing gaps in skill and knowledge. That's it. Training doesn't help with motivation. It doesn't help with it, you know, all these other things that people think that training is an appropriate tool for. It's not. Um, so, number one, if you're a practitioner in this particular field, training is only appropriate. I'm going to say it again for closing gaps in skill and or knowledge. If it's an issue, right? If it's a health issue, if it's a policy issue, if it's an environmental issue, if it's a rewarding consequence issue, training is not going to solve that problem. And we know that, I mean, kind of logically. And a lot of times people go, well, Trish, I've been trying to fight that fight for a while. Okay, have you? Because the big thing is people go, well, people ask for training all the time and it's inappropriate what my business stakeholders are asking for. Yeah, but have we been educating them on the other tools in the toolkit? Have we, have we helped them understand? Because there's a lot of reasons why it is that people jump to training as the hammer to hit all these nails with, right? Anytime there's a people problem, it comes down to being a training problem. And part of that, and I remember a conversation I had with Jane Bozarth some years ago, and she made the best observation, and that is people tend to think of people problems as their educational experiences. So because we came up through education and academia, because we were educated to some degree as children up into at least early parts of our adulthood, whether you went to college or not, we went into, we confuse or we think of education as being the thing that we use in order to solve the people problem. And the people whom we work with and whom we serve in the organizations that we serve have that same kind of perspective. And so they don't even know that these other tools exist. And we need to get better um, and fast at being able to have those conversations to help educate people on other tools that are available and and look for opportunities that we can help um, that we can help serve instead of jumping to training and using it as a tool in inappropriate in inappropriate practices. What was it? Was it? Um, was it Maslow who said, "If you, if all you have is a hammer, you see all the world as a nail." Exactly, and and that's that's definitely what we do at training. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, preach on. <laughs> um, my, I have two things yet here for us. The the second to the last thing is that I was looking for some stories that you might tell about people in the profession, just to maybe introduce them to our audience or introduce uh, another aspect of them, some funny stories or from work or, or uh, hanging out after conferences or that. Uh, um, do you have some people that you had in mind for this? I, I, I do. I, I've got a couple of, there, there are many, many stories that I could share. In a, um, but I think, you know, one of, one of my favorite stories that first got me hooked on your work was the story that you tell of this young professor at um, Indiana University who piled a bunch of people in his car and took them to the first um, ISPI conference. And I won't give away who that young professor was at the time. And actually, if I remember correctly, had them sleep on his hotel room floor yes. um, so that people who wanted to participate in that. And I and I love those stories because it makes these people that we read about in books and that we study in class um, that much more human. And um, so in the spirit of that, I've, I've got some stories about being very human. 
So, um, so one of the things in the ASTD competency model uh, back when I had the CPLP practice was that I got to know the people that were referenced in the model really, really, really well. And I and the reason why I did that was because I'm. I know my superpower is being the person that can spot patterns and connect things together and synthesize. And I am more the, you know, the, the, um, the Jill of all trades and the master of none, Mm -hmm. rather than being the person that drills down into a particular functional area or into a particular vertical. But I wanted to get to know the people that are, you know, deep into these different areas of expertise who are rock stars in training delivery and instructional design and change management and measurement and evaluation and, and all of the other areas of expertise that were in the ASD competency model at the time. And so that is how I came to know Tiagi. That is how I came to know Elaine Beek. That is how I came to know Bob Pike. That is how I came to know the Kirkpatricks. Um, and actually had the honor and the privilege of being, Owl's Ledge was the official host of Don Kirkpatrick's retirement celebration in 2011 after um, Dr. Kirkpatrick gave his final um, public presentation. Uh, and, you know, I, because I wanted to be able to get to know those people to understand the work better and at a deeper level. And I also wanted to be able to call on people in order to be able to have them available to my clients so that as we identified gaps in the competency model of where it is that they needed to do more work, that I could bring in the best of the best, right? I mean, you know, who better than the people that are referenced not only in the ASTD materials, but in many other professional associations around the world. And so I remember, um, so a couple of things real quick. So I, I wound up in all of this um, at one point, uh, you know, I, I actually, Guy, I just um, celebrated my 50th birthday, so milestone. And um, this is significant to me for a number of reasons. But uh, one of them is when I started my 40th birthday, um, it was in a very different um, space in my life. I had actually just become widowed. I had just lost my husband. Uh, and I shortly into my 40s when I turned 41 is when I was diagnosed with stage three cancer and uh, lymphoma was hospitalized and went through a number of um, uh, treatments and protocols that actually, uh, of course, changed my life for a long period of time. So I started my 40s in a very different way than I'm starting now my, my 50s and I'm going to knock on some wood. And I really want to bring forward the community that came together around me. It was um, Jack and Patty Phillips, um, who were very comforting at that time. Bob Pike, who was very comforting at that time. Wendy Kirkpatrick, who sent me um, silk headscarves for me to wear um, around my head. It was Lou Russell, who helped push me in the wheelchair at the ASTD conference in Chicago in 2010. Uh, along with my brother and my sister-in-law who had flown out to help me. Um, my good friend uh, and colleague, Rini McClay, who, um, who helped me through you know, a big part of that, uh, both in the hospital when I was hospitalized and then coming out of the conference. And so getting to know people at a personal level, this isn't just a practice to me and just a discipline and work. It's people being people together and people being really human together. And at the time that I have had some very, um, very vulnerable times, uh, it's been amazing the people that have stepped up in my life from parts of my life, like my work life, that I would have never expected to have played um, the part that they did. Uh, Valerie Knoll, who she and her husband going to Florida, driving to Florida from Nebraska, made an excuse to stop in Chicago. you know, just people that just kind of came out of the woodwork in order to support. And I and I think it's very easy at times to get lost in the day to day that the, especially people that are figures in this industry and celebrities in, in some ways, I would say, um, and, and highly well recognized to understand that they're also people too. And that um, who was it? I think it was Ram Das who said, we're all bozos on the bus, right? Like everybody's just trying to like, you know, kind of like come together and figure it out. And how do we, how do we have um, a little kindness? And one last thing, cause this always makes me laugh. I remember um, back when I was on the board of directors with uh, CCS today and I was bringing in Bob Pike um, to do a workshop. And this is when Bob was still with the Bob Pike group and, and so on and so forth. And, and uh, so Bob came in and, and I was really excited 
Um, we were going through the whole logistics conversation. Did Bob want to rent a car? Did he want somebody to come and pick him up at the airport? Like, what was his preference and all that kind of thing? And I remember, um, cause he was coming in and out real quick and it was like, well, if we could just send somebody to get him at the airport and then bring him in and then take him back, that would be great. And I remember being really excited with Bob on the phone. And I said to Bob, I said, you know what? I'm really excited. I said, I, you know, somebody's coming to pick you up at the airport. And I said, I just got to tell you, Bob, she has no idea who you are. And cause I wanted to make sure that it was going to be somebody who wasn't going to like, you know, cause I would hate to be like, tr- I, you know, I was putting my own thoughts onto him projecting onto him and thinking you know i wouldn't want somebody who's going to have me trapped in this car and like try and you know just suck the energy out of me i wanted somebody that was going to be attentive to him and take care of him but not bother him you know Mm -hmm. and i'll never forget what it is that bob pike said to me he goes trish he goes there are millions of people who don't know who i am (laughs) (laughs) i said well that's that's fantastic and so i you know, again, very humbling and very human experiences. And so I would say, you know, as you interact with people, you know, especially at different events and especially in social media and especially online, if there's somebody who's really made a difference to you in your practice and has you really admire, tell them, you know, tell them um, and take the opportunities that we have in order to connect now while we have an opportunity to connect now that we should we should honor these things about being people in a business together and and all of us being bozos on this bus. Mm-hmm. So thank you, Guy Wallace, oh. for all that you do. Well, that's, we, it, it was it was uh, the bozos on this bus. I'm not sure where the where it really originated, but I went back to Fire Sign Theater back in the uh, 60s. Uh, with that reference, uh, any anyway, yep. so so um, to wrap this up, mm. um, my final question is: What words of wisdom or guidance would you have for new people coming in? Now you've talked a little bit about this, but uh, just as a kind of a final wrap here, what's your what's your message to them? New people coming in, besides reading a lot and looking at all the resources that you identified earlier, what, what, what would your guidance be? You meet a new person, they say, I'm new, what, what, what should I do first? I would say trust your, trust your instincts. You know, there's a lot of us that are accidental that came into this particular space. Um, you know, like I, we opened the call with, you know, I'm an equestrian studies major, um, and people have said to me, you know, at different times, like, well, how did that get you into, you know, these different practices? And of course, I've, I've vetted a lot of that, a lot of that out. But, but one of the things that I realized early in my career was if I could stand in a riding ring with a thousand pound animals, um, skittish horses and very green riders and be able to hold my ground, then I could probably stand in any classroom. And I, I did vet that out in the law firm. So I can tell you that I could probably stand um, anywhere. And so, you know, your work applied from other practices in your life and other experiences in your life, work experiences, experiences as a parent, as a sibling, as an aunt, as an uncle, as a spouse. I mean, you know, things drawing from your personal life is trust your instincts. And then, you know, look at then validating those practices against the research and the work that's out there. But trust in yourself that this ability of being able to apply from other domains is a is a is a real superpower, and that there are many um, of us that have come before that have done the same, and we're just thrilled that you're here. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Well, uh, this was an excellent interview. I thank you so much for participating in this with me, and uh, I. I look forward to meeting you in person someday versus just the <laughs> social media and virtual and now through Skype. But uh, again, thanks so much for, for your contributions. Have a great day. Well, well, yay cake guy. And thank you so much for all of your contributions. And thanks for spending all this time today. Bye, everybody.